Thank you for watching this video from the Canada-Europe Transatlantic Dialogue at Carleton University. This event is sponsored by the Canada-Europe Transatlantic Dialogue, CETD, and the Faculty of Public Affairs Research Month at Carleton University. CETD receives funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The views expressed in this video are solely those of the presenter and do not reflect the views of the CETD, SHRC, or Carleton University. First off, let me thank uh, Joan for her leadership and stewardship and Dara and Marcel for their organizational skills and all of you for bringing springtime to Ottawa. Uh, I'm talking about policies to save the Euro and the Eurozone crisis, which means that I'm gonna go over some very familiar ground. Most of us have spent years wandering around Canada and the United States and anywhere talking about this, so I'll, it'll be a bit repetitive, but not too much. I took my mandate to be thinking about policy transferability between different jurisdictions, perhaps Canada and the EU. Okay, that's the background. Uh, and there's a twist in the argument. The twist is that you can, we can think in very elegant intellectual terms, particularly economists can think this way, uh, about policies or pu public policy students can do this as well. But uh, these elegant, uh, abstract ways of talking about policies uh, don't really work very well when you look at comparisons because it's extremely difficult to follow these abstract policies through different institutional contexts. That's my twist. It's an obvious one. And I'm gonna talk uh, very quickly about the background to the Eurozone crisis then about the policies that were used to confront them, and, and then about brief, very, very briefly about alternative possibilities, uh, the roads not taken, and, and uh, then uh, most importantly about the role of EU institutions in the ways in which policies were pursued, and then a brief comparative conclusion. Uh, the pol uh, uh, first of all, the background to the crisis, to the Eurozone crisis. We all have read the Maastricht Treaty, I presume. Uh, but if you look at the EM, it, it, you have to read the newspapers, that's all. Uh, EMU in the Maastricht Treaty, the Eurozone in the Maastricht Treaty, was a very, very flawed arrangement. We can account for it by looking at the negotiations. But it was institutionally flawed and incomplete. I can make a list. We could all make a list of what was wrong with it. Uh, <coughs> there were hopes among the negotiators at the time, I was sort of a peripheral to some of these people, uh, that these flaws would be corrected over time because political constituencies were recognized that there were flaws and they would be corrected and that was the way the Monet method worked and so on. Uh, that didn't happen. We had 10 years after the designation of EMU members uh, uh, in 1998 of Illusions, a lot of illusions, I think. Uh, everything was going well in the global economy except for a couple of years. Uh, but inside the new Eurozone, rather than convergence, there was divergence. Uh, there were current accounts problems developing, in particular in the poorer states. Uh, in, the we in these poorer states, growth was pumped very often by borrowing, given the global financial setting, etc. Uh, again, you've all thought about this. And what happened, of course, was the global crisis and then the global crisis feeding into uh, the Eurozone and exploiting the Eurozone's flaws over time. And the global crisis made things more difficult for the people who were gonna be really victimized by the Eurozone crisis because everybody had to borrow in order to keep from going into a new Great Depression. And you had you know, people going, governments going into debt, further into debt, they were already in debt, many of them. And then the working of automatic stabilizers and the declining growth, they were all, all combined to increase debt levels. And the Eurozone, uh, Eurozone crisis, crisis, as we well know, is a product uh, initially of the Greeks, new Greek prime minister announcing that the Greeks had cooked their books. Uh, they hadn't been telling the truth. I got it. Everybody knew this, I think. But the, but when it was announced, it became clear that the Greece, Greeks, other, th other things being equal, were on their way to bankruptcy, and there were other people in the background who were also had similar problems. And uh, the financial 
markets were in bananas, to use a social science term, uh, jacking up their interest rates, and, and then the Greeks really were headed towards bankruptcy very, very quickly. Uh, okay, second uh, issue is how did the EU respond? How did the Eurogroup respond? How did the EU respond? Uh, and one first answer, we're moving towards policies, is hesitantly. Uh, it took six months or so before anybody did anything, and that was largely because the Germans were hesitant about what to do, but it was an institutional issue as well. Uh, and the second answer to what was done came in two parts, and something like this very, very briefly. Uh, one side was bailouts from uh, national loans, uh, well, IMF loans all put together in the EU budget, uh, that were uh, conditional and very, very heavy terms that involved the recipients pursuing harsh austerity programs uh, and pushed towards quite dramatic structural reforms, particularly in social policy and taxation policy, uh, and, the, and basically it obliged the recipients to internal de devaluations. I don't need to elabor elaborate what that is, but squeezing down uh, wage levels and so on. In theory, this was supposed to lead them back to some kind of convergence and greater growth eventually, okay? Uh, the second part of this, uh, uh, we also, I think, remember, uh, was correcting critical flaws in, in, in Eurozone and EMU. And here there are a number of, of, of elaborate reforms, some of them very intelligent, I think, to my mind, uh, that would allow much greater enforcement of the rules of the EMU on its members. Uh, this uh, is very hard to, uh, also the, uh, some of the, these things were put upon the commission, the commission gained some power in all of this. And the new requirements ensured that countries would have to have balanced budgets, uh, uh, there would be a banking union, Patrick's gonna talk about banking union, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, it's very, very hard to talk, to know whether these things have been effective because they're new, the second, this second part of it. In the first part of it, it's, not, it's quite clear that we can talk about results. Uh, and so far they've been mixed, I think. Uh, we have to keep in mind that the damages were very, very serious. The problems were very, very serious. And these take a long time to, 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 to be fixed. Anyway, as austerity we know it reduced growth, and particularly the, the recipient loan countries, and it rose, it pushed unemployment up, and it it, uh, it just made things uh, very unpleasant for Greeks and Portuguese, and to some extent the Irish and the Cypriots, and etc. Uh, uh, the austerity policies also, and this is probably more important in the longer run, although it's very difficult to talk about, I think have impacted very severely on the EU's political legitimacy, and particularly in the states that were the, the targets of austerity policies, but everywhere else as well. Uh, this was not a happy uh, policy turn, and it, people received it with unhappiness, uh, and there's a whole lot of evidence in, electorals, in electoral changes, but also in uh, assistance in the rise of uh, Eurosceptic, uh, xenophobic parties on the right and, and left parties of a populist kind. Uh, this, uh, we don't know how long these effects will last. It's a very difficult thing to talk about, I think, but they are there. Uh, the story, in other words, is long and unfinished, but it's, an, it's not that happy a story. Where are there alternatives, my third part? Well, I, I don't need to talk very much about it. Anybody who reads the New York Times or uh, Barry Eichengreen or Paul Krugman uh, knows that it's something that looks like crisis, neo-Keynesianism, uh, which focuses uh, that the EU should have, instead of doing what it did, pumped up demand to create, uh, uh, to create growth and, and to limit unemployment. Uh, and this might have created an environment in which the necessary structural reforms also, a, a, a gentler environment to pursue structural reforms. Uh, and this would have been done by Mario Draghi creating more money, uh, governments creating more money, uh, going into debt, uh, and also by promoting more burden sharing. One of the things about the, the policies that were, were decided was it didn't involve re real burden sharing, it involved loaning money to be repaid. Uh, 
even if money, much of it won't be repaid. We know that. But, uh, uh, but the point about this was it wasn't tried. And had it been tried, there was a serious issue, which I think the Germans were very probably right to point out. Moral hazard uh, it makes it very difficult to do reforms. Uh, when your people are throwing money at you, why should I reform? They're throwing money at me, etc. We know that. Okay, uh, but the, the, key, the key issue to me here is, is uh, EU institutions. The, these policies didn't come out of an economics textbook, or they may have come out of some of them, but they came through the institutions of the European Union, particularly the Eurogroup and the European Council. Uh, and we all know the EU is not a unified jurisdiction, EU studies, number one. Uh, it's state-like in some ways, but not a state. It does have some elements of supranational power. I haven't got time to talk about them. Uh, but when the rubber hits the road, particularly in a crisis, or about a very large decision about national sovereignty, as was the case in this crisis, uh, these decisions are made intergovernmentally uh, by multilateral negotiations among member states. Uh, the EU is not the WTO or the UN. I mean, there are built-in incentives to try to reach consensus and try to, to really make deals. Uh, and they make a difference and it's also an attempt to make the larger states not quite as powerful relative to the smaller states as they otherwise would be. But still, that's the way it works. Multilateral negotiations between member states. And these international relations tells us, and this is one of the more important things that I think it tells us with some degree of truth, uh, that these kinds of negotiations have a certain kind of logic. They're slow, they're cumbersome, it takes a long time to reach decisions. That's not great in a period of crisis. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, they also tend to produce agreements that are suboptimal in some ways. Uh, don't hold me to defining suboptimal, but they also uh, can lead to mistakes depending upon the power situation between groups. But most important here is that decisions tend to be shaped despite all of the mechanisms built into the, the decision rules, uh, shaped by the more powerful members. And I, I don't mean in general that the more powerful members decide everything or a specific more powerful member decides everything, but depending upon the relative power of member states in a situation like this, the more powerful are likely to come out on top. Uh, and, and we know who is the more, which country is the most powerful economically in these decisions in the Eurozone crisis, uh, Germany, of course. Uh, decisions in this kind of model can be reached or pushed by some countries and they can be perceived as because they really are imposed by that country on others. That's probably the major source of legitimacy, legitimacy issues. And a, a pretty convincing argument can be made that all of these things came into play in the policy negotiations about the Eurozone crisis. Crisis dealing was slow and cumbersome. There are several major mistakes that, ma I, when I say major mistakes, I'm not talking about you know a C grade on an exam. I'm talking about something that made the financial markets very excited, pushed up interest rates, caused a uh, bad economic situation to get worse, and so on. Uh, several mistakes of that kind. Uh, but the most important thing about this is that the negotiations that were dominated, dominated is too strong a word, but prevent, pre the, German preferences tended to prevail in the policy debate, to put it as simply. The austerian approach, that's Mark Bly's word, of course, uh, to confronting the crisis really did come from German auto liberal uh, positions. Uh, Germany was not alone. The Finns backed them, the Dutch backed them, and two or three smaller Central Europe, the Slovaks backed them for, for reasons that escaped me, but the Slovaks remain a mystery to me. Uh, 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 but anyway, these, these, uh, these, these positions were not the positions of a, a, a federal government. They were the positions of one government or several governments that were powerful that came 
You have to, have to wake up. You have to wake up now. You have to wake up now. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Okay. <laughs> Whether the, the, these policies were the right policies to follow is not my business. And they were costly policies, it's quite clear. But the point is that they were not the policies of a single government. They were the policies of a big, powerful government and a few allies imposed on a bunch of countries that didn't have any power in the negotiation, or very little power in the negotiation at all. Uh, and, okay, that's, uh, I think, a serious business. Uh, one result, and the data support this pretty clearly, is that those who were policy takers in this situation, the poorer countries and some of them not so poor, Italy and France, uh, I have in mind, uh, clearly recognized that these policies were not their own. And this filtered back into the domestic political lives of, of all of these countries. Uh, and I think this is probably something that's not good for the Euro's future, but I'll leave it at that. So very, very briefly, my argument of, um, arg argumentative twist. Uh, policies, we can talk about them the way economists talk about them. But the institutions that decide them shape them ex ante and produce ex post outcomes uh, that are very, very different from the abstract models uh, that are brought into debate. And it's hard to follow the Eurozone crisis without thinking something like this, uh, how the policies emerged and how they were implemented is almost as important as the content of the policies, but they go together as a package. Uh, and if we think about, I thought we were supposed to talk about Canada, I'm not good at talking about Canada because I'm an American, but uh, if we think about the transferability God knows that Canada, we hope, would never be faced by this kind of situation. There are good reasons why it wasn't. Uh, but it's really very hard to think that these kinds of policies would come out in the same way in Canada because Canada is a federal state. There, of course, there would be negotiations between provinces and so on. Uh, Canada had a central bank, has a central bank that works rather well. It had a relatively well-regulated banking structure. Uh, uh, in other words, thinking about policies in the abstract doesn't give you a handle on thinking about what's going to happen uh, until you've considered what the institutions are. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much.